Welcome to our study of the book of Hebrews. I'm really excited about our time together. We are going to work our way through this beautiful, complex book, step by step, unpacking its powerful message in a way that will help us live more effectively for Christ. Normally, we start book studies with issues of authorship, date, destination, and purpose, and we're going to get to those in the first couple of sessions, but I want to start with a piece of historical fiction that can draw us into Hebrews' world and give us a sense of what the hearers were dealing with. Antonius sat alone in a deteriorating second-story apartment located in a slum on the slope of Escaline Hill in Rome. As rain pelted the age-worn wall outside, a plate of bread and vegetables and a cup of sour wine rested on the makeshift table. The room had turned dark with the coming of this storm, and Antonius lit a small lamp against the gloom. With the light, hungry roaches materialized, scampering to the dark safety of cracks in the wall. In the apartment next door, a baby cried, and the infant's father screamed obscenities at the infant's mother. An urgent conversation rose and then faded as an unseen pair of business partners walked down the stairs. Somewhere in the muddy street below, a unit of Roman soldiers marched past, driven under sharp orders from its commander. And Antonius sat alone, thinking. That morning, his employer, a rough, burly fellow named Brutus, once again turned from the task of pricing fruits and vegetables to ridicule this young Christian. The verbal jabs had become as annoying as gnats darting to and fro in the shop's pungent air. Brutus was big, obnoxious, and cruel. Antonius cringed against the man's emotional blows, wishing he could strike back out of his hurt and embarrassment. Each time he turned the other cheek, it received a slap. Yet he bit his lip, nursed his wounded pride, and again asked the Lord's forgiveness for his thoughts. Persecution of the church in Rome had yet to result in martyrdom, but since the expulsion of Jews under the Emperor Claudius, Christians had continued to be harassed to various degrees by both Jews and pagans. Upon the expulsion, some had suffered imprisonment, beatings, and the seizure of their property. That was almost 15 years ago now. Antonius had not been part of the Christian church at the time, but had heard about the conflict. In fact, his own grandfather, ruler of the synagogue of the Augustenses, had been one of the most outspoken opponents of the Christians. When, at 17, Antonius had converted to following Christ, the old man almost died, declaring Antonius dead in a shouting match that ended in tears and a tattered relationship. In recent months, abuse of the church had escalated with the amused approval of the emperor himself, and now emotional fatigue was taking its toll. Footsteps in the hall, a scream in the night, meaningless events that nevertheless set Antonius's heart racing. He had been told the cost of following the Messiah, but somehow his experience was different than he expected. In the beginning, he thought the joy would never be broken, that he would always feel the presence of God. He had been taught the Lord, the righteous judge, would vindicate his new covenant people. Did not the scriptures say, speaking of the Messiah, that God had put all things in subjection under his feet? But the church had taken a great beating lately, and members of its various house groups had become discouraged and were questioning whether Christ really was in control. In their hearts, they wondered if God had closed his ears against their cries for relief. Some, in their disillusionment, doubted and left the church altogether. Antonius Bar David remembered the traditions of the synagogue and the support of the Jewish community. He remembered the joy of the festivals and the solemn celebrations of the Jewish calendar. He appreciated the fellowship of Christ's community, but he genuinely missed the traditions of his ancestors, and he missed the members of his family. He watched them from a distance as they walked together to market by the Tiber River, 
Some of them still would not speak to him and passed him on the street as they would a Gentile. That was very difficult. And today his loneliness closed in around him like a dark, damp blanket. To make matters worse, he was one of the poorer members of the church. When Antonius became a believer in Christ, he lost his job as a tailor's apprentice in the Jewish quarter. He now spent his days sorting rotting produce, sweeping the floor, swatting flies, and receiving orders from obnoxious Roman slaves shopping for rich mistresses. He stooped so low as to take pieces of rotting fruit home to supplement his meager food supply. Even rich men's slaves fared better. Earlier in the week, Gaius, the kitchen slave of an equestrian who lived in the area, tossed him a handful of overripe figs saying, here, Christian, change your cannibalistic diet by taking a bit of good fruit. Laughter hung with the gnats in the air. To be poor and a Christian invited double portions of ridicule. Antonius had missed the weekly meal and worship for the past two weeks, and his heart had cooled somewhat toward the little house group. A spiritual itch warned him, cautioning him concerning his loss of perspective, and yet in recent days he had begun to snuff such thoughts from his mind as quickly as they came. Antonius's bitterness over his current circumstances was growing and slowly obscuring the truth. That night, the believers were to meet for worship and encouragement. Rumor had it that the leaders had received a document from back east somewhere. Although discouraged and tempted to skip the meeting again, Antonius's curiosity was aroused and he decided to travel the short distance to the neighborhood house at which the fellowship was to meet. Entering the gathering room, he spoke greetings to several friends who also looked tired from the day's work. The hostess offered something to drink and friendly banter, but dejection hung like a cloud over the room. When the meal was finished, the group's leader, a good and godly man of almost 70 years, finally arrived. Joseph was a bit out of breath, having come from a meeting with other leaders halfway across the city. He was visibly moved as he stood smiling before the group of about 20, his hands shaking slightly from advancing age. After a few words of introduction, Joseph took a deep breath and explained that he had talked the other leaders into allowing his group the first reading of the scroll. With a twinkle in his eye, the elder said, I believe you will find this quite relevant. He unrolled the first part of the parchment and began reading with vigor. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Now I start with the story about Antonius because I want us to understand that Hebrews was written for real people real people who struggled with enduring in the faith in a difficult world. The book was not crafted as a theological treatise, but as a work of pastoral theology with a purpose. Now, I want us to talk in this first session a little bit about the original audience and where they might have lived when the book might have been written. So let's talk a little bit about the audience. Most scholars today think that Hebrews was written for a group of believers in the city of Rome. In Hebrews 13, 24, when the author is wrapping up the book, he sends greetings with these words, the Italians greet you. And many scholars think that that is most most naturally read as speaking of people who were with the author who were from Italy and are sending greetings back to their compatriots there uh, in the city of Rome. We know that in the city of Rome, there were about 40 to 60,000 Jews in the middle of the first century. The church in the city probably was started when uh, people who had been at the day of Pentecost, uh, 
who had received Christ, received the Spirit, went back to Rome and then started the church. We don't know that for sure, but that may be what happened. A couple of other pieces of evidence point to Rome as the destination of this book. First Clement, for instance, is a book that was written at the very end of the first century. And it was the first book that we have to quote the book of Hebrews. It seems to depend on Hebrews in about 18 different places. That book uh, and a couple of others, the Shepherd of Hermas, for instance, uh, refer to the leaders of the church, not as elders, but as leaders, as leaders. That's the terminology that is used for the pastors who are over the church. And Hebrews does this as well in chapter 13. So Hebrews has several elements that seem to point to the city of Rome as the destination. Well, a second thing about this audience to whom Hebrews is written is that they probably had a background in the Jewish synagogue. Uh, Hebrews is permeated with the Old Testament, for instance. It is more permeated with the Old Testament than any other book in the New Testament, with the exception of the book of Revelation. The author over and over again uses rabbinic techniques of argument as he is making his case for Jesus as the superior Lord of the universe. And so what happens in Hebrews is we find a book that in almost every verse is shaped and molded by a use of the Jewish scriptures. And so the author uses this terminology and the language of the scriptural text to make his cases. And so it seems that the audience would have had some familiarity with those scriptures. Uh, the Jewish theology of the book really also seems to fit believers who are from a Jewish background, but of the diaspora, those who are outside of the land of Israel, uh, scattered abroad throughout the Mediterranean world somewhere. So these were people who were in the city of Rome, who had a background in the Jewish synagogue. But third, it is clear from the book that they were also struggling with persevering in the faith. And this really brings us to the heart of why the book of Hebrews was written in the first place. For instance, we read a passage like Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we don't drift away from it. Uh, the author challenges the hearers over and over and over again to hang in there, to not fall away from God, not drift away from God, but to persevere in following him in the world. We have images, for instance, of the wilderness wandering that we'll see in chapter 3. And those wanderers in the wilderness who fell and were disobedient to God, in Judaism of the first century, they were kind of a key example for what you don't want to do. You want to persevere in following God, trusting Him as you're going through the world. So it seems that these believers were really struggling with hanging in there in their faith in Christ, uh, they probably were beginning to face a lot of persecution from the evidence that we find in the book. Now, in terms of when Hebrews was written, it seems that these believers had been believers for a while. We look at a passage like Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 6, 3, and the author says to them, look, by this time, you guys ought to be teachers, but you need somebody to go back and teach you the ABCs of the faith. So they seem to have been believers for a while. They had faced difficulties in the past. So in chapter 10, verses 32 and following, we find that uh, these are people who have been faithful in the past in spite of really intense persecution that they had faced. But they're now facing increased persecution again and yet they had not been martyred for the faith. We see that in chapter 12, verse 4. People like uh, William Lane in his word, Biblical Commentary, believe that all of these different aspects can be kind of pulled together to suggest that Hebrews was perhaps written in sometime about A.D. 63 
or 64, just before the escalating persecution under the Emperor Nero, which took place uh, beginning in 64 AD, and then it, it got to be very intense. He was actually using Christians to light his gardens. He would crucify them and put pitch on their bodies and then set them on fire to light up his gardens. So we find that here is a group of people that the author is addressing who uh, have been faithful in the past, they've been believers for a while, but now they're in a situation where intensity is mounting and they have some decisions to make. In fact, some people of the group seem to already have one foot out the door and the author is trying to marshal a word of encouragement and exhortation for them grounded in the scriptures, pointing to Jesus to help them hang in there in the faith. And it is a very relevant message for you and me as we face our difficulties in the world today.